Good morning or evening, depending on your location, and uh, welcome to Washington, D.C. for another episode of Rethinking Capitalism and Democracy series, brought to you by the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, here in the Elliott School of International Affairs of the George Washington University. I'm James Foster, Vice Dean of the Elliott School, standing in for Jay Shambaugh, the director of IAP, who had to be away today. We're really glad you've joined us for today's presentation, Negative Economic Shocks, Can Our Fragile Democracies Take the Hit? By William White of the C.D. Howe Institute in Canada, who you might also know from his work with the OECD, the Bank for International Settlements, and the Bank of Canada. I believe the last time you were here in the Elliott School was the conference Governing Finance for Sustainability in 2019. Is that right? Yes, well, yes. Very pleasant experience. It was. It was a lot of fun. Welcome back, albeit virtually this time. As discussants, we have two amazing scholars. First, our own Marty Finnamore. University Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at GW, who's received international acclaim for her work on governance and international organizations, but is also good fun as a colleague. Welcome, Marty. Thank you. Our second discussant is one of the greats of economic theory, Alan Kerman, Director of Studies at the Col des Odes Etude in Paris, who I first met through his, that's my uh, uh, college French, which has gone totally down the toilet, who I first <laughs> met through his wonderful text on general uh, equilibrium theory, which I did my thesis on, uh, that wonderful text with Werner Hildenbrandt, but whose work spans now an incredible array of areas from complex systems to ranking economics departments. Welcome, Professor Kerman. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Good to meet you. In, in just a moment, I'll turn the virtual podium over to my colleague, Sunil Sharma, for formal in introductions and uh, a few words to lay, lay, lay down what we're going to talk about. But I'd first like to say a brief word about the Institute and our school. IIEP is an institute in GW that supports nonpartisan policy relevant research in the areas of international finance, international trade, and international development, and also convenes great events like this one. Now spring term is just about over here in GW. Students are busily taking finals and are getting ready to graduate or just leave for the summer, but things are still hopping at IIEP which just had another episode in its Facing Inequality series on inequality and poverty in pre-industrial times. And later this week on Friday, we'll host the 11th annual Washington Area International Trade Symposium held in person and online. You can check out IEP's website for these and more events. And if you miss something, you can hop over to the YouTube channel to see a rerun. Now, as a top school of international affairs, the Elliott School has an amazing group of faculty and students who take full advantage of its location in the heart of DC, just blocks away from Treasury, from the World Bank, from the IMF, Commerce, USAID, and the State Department. This year brought an amazing range of folks to the Elliott School. Fiona <laughs> Hill, Ken Rudd, my old friend, former WTO Appellate Court Chief Justice Jim Bacchus, and a great panel discussion presented by the International Women of Elliott that included Dean Alyssa Ayers and GW alumna Dana Bash. And finally, it has been a great, a really great to return in person to classes and to events, but we're gonna to continue to take advantage of the amazing reach of our online and hybrid events. So now let me turn this thing over to my good old friend and grad school colleague, colleague um, Sunil Sharma, a 25 year survivor of our neighboring institution 
and in his spare time when he's not writing papers on systemic hazards with his better half and Florini, or articles on the structural reforms required to safeguard democracy with today's speaker, he's a distinguished scholar at IIEP. Thank you, Sunil, for organizing today's event. Take it away. Uh, thanks very much, James, um, and welcome everybody to our 14th seminar in the series on um, rethinking capitalism and democracy. Um, the series focuses on systemic issues and today's uh, topic, um, if nothing, it is very, very broad. It looks at negative economic shocks. Can our fragile democracies take the hit? Um, let me say a few words on the topic. Um, capitalist democracies seem under considerable stress. Inequality, economic insecurity, and political and social divisiveness are threatening to upend democratic norms um, and institutions. So what underpins capitalist democracies? First, obviously, access to the ballot box, fair elections. The fundamental objective is, of course, to translate public preferences into public policy. A degree of uh, political and economic equality. They go together and too much economic and political power concentration does not work as it can distort the system. Prevent, or preventing the tyranny of the powerful and the majority is also an important aspect of capitalist democracies. Third, the panoply of um, political, government, economic and market and social institutions that make the system function and also maintain the system. Um, I might add that the state versus market dichotomy tends not to be useful. And I really do not know of a country where the state is dysfunctional and the market economy delivers inclusive growth. Fourth, trust in the system that makes people believe in the rules of the game and the outcomes. So in a word, legitimacy, trust matters. And the fifth, I might add, um, in, 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 in the digital age, in the Anthropocene, an uncontaminated digital public square that allows for a public discussion of systemic problems um, and other issues. And given the environmental crisis that our scientists tell us that we are in, um, we need to have a constituency, or at least create a constituency to make sure that um, nature has a seat at the decision-making table. So coming back to today's discussion, if you think of countries and our global system is composed of four sectors, um, the political and government, economic and financial, um, civil society, and the national environment, that four by four matrix truly um, involves a lot of very, very complex interactions. It's, it's a collection of subsystems which themselves are very complex and the interactions are, 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 are truly give rise to complexity. And at the evolution that we are in, at the current juncture, it's become hard to predict um, how that will evolve. By changing policies and behaviors, we are trying to nudge uh, countries and the system uh, towards a more sustainable path uh, for human development. Now, given the enormity of the problem, and, and the dimensionality of the problem. What we're not going to do today is to focus on a sub-matrix, basically focus on um, economic and financial uh, issues and their interaction with political and governance issues. Uh, of course, given uh, the nature of the problem, we might stray. Now, let me say a few words. We really do have a stellar panel uh, to address the topic. As, as, as my colleague James has already mentioned, um, you know, William Bill White, is, is, is currently um, in, in Toronto, but he has been a senior policymaker and a keen observer of globalization over many decades. Um, you know, from his vantage point as uh, you know, deputy governor of the Central Bank in Canada, the chief economic advisor at the BIS, the chairman of the OECD's Economic and Development Committee, uh, he really has been um, involved um, in everything from economic and financial policy um, and, and observing it very, very closely. Um, and he and I, I would add, our colleagues at the, at, at the Council of Economic Policies in Zurich, and I've learned a lot uh, from my interactions with him. Uh, Martha Finnemore 
is, is one of our local political science gurus. As, as, as James mentioned, um, you know, she's university professor of political science and international affairs, um, and her research focuses on, on, on a very broad spectrum, which is relevant to today's discussion on global governance, international organizations, um, cybersecurity, ethics, and social theory. And she's authored some excellent books on the subject, Rules for the World, International Organization in Global Politics in 2004, Who Runs the Globe, 2010, Back to Basics, State Power in a Contemporary World, 2013. And she's written extensively on the problems of the liberal international order. Last but not least, Alan Kerman, as James mentioned, is, is someone we all grew up um, learning our basic economic theory and especially general equilibrium theory uh, from his books and writing. He's um, a distinguished professor um, of economics at, um, and director of studies at the uh, Ecole des Hautes Etudes in Paris. He's held professorships in several American and French universities and the European University in, uh, Institute in Florence. He's also the chief advisor to the OECD um, National and New Approaches to Economic Challenges Initiative. And he's published um, over uh, 160 articles and is the author of five books, including uh, Complex Economics from Individual to Collective Rationality in 2013. We really are truly, truly fortunate to have all three of them together to address our topic. With that, uh, let me turn the floor, or should I say the airwaves over to, to Bill White. Well, uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sunil. And um, thank you all for this. Um, sorry, let me try to get my screen, screen up. There we go. Super, just a moment. Good. Can everyone see that? Okay, let, let me um, begin by thanking uh, Sunil and, and others for this invitation. I think it's going to be uh, interesting and uh, I won't say fun because I think the topic is a bit too uh, um, fragile for that. Um, let me distinguish between uh, the theme of my presentation and uh, my purpose in giving it. Uh, the, the basic theme is, uh, as you can see from the title, uh, I'm going to suggest that our economic system is in uh, not a particularly good shape, uh, that it is fragile, that it is uh, subject to various shocks that could render it unstable. And my concern is that our fragile democracies, uh, themselves unstable, uh, may not be able to um, support uh, uh, themselves in those circumstances. Uh, so that's the basic theme. Uh, my purpose today is not to suggest uh, solutions for all of these problems. Uh, as Sunil suggested, um, there's many dimensions to this, and it is going to take a lot of thought. My concern, and I guess this is what I'm trying to emphasize, is the urgency of the problem, and that uh, perhaps nudges may not be enough, that we should be uh, thinking very, very seriously about getting the public's attention and trying to do something about the, the underlying uh, problems. Um, I think we could be sort of one serious economic downturn, whether an inflationary one or a deflationary one, from some significant changes in our political order. Um, OK, uh, I start each of these slides with a little uh, quote from somebody. The first one here, what's the nature of the policy problem we face? I, I think uh, Tolstoy got this right. He said, uh, all happy families are the same, but each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And uh, what, <clears throat> what he meant by that was that um, to get happiness, a lot of things have to come together in a family. And if any one of them uh, is threatened, uh, they're all, 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 the whole happiness ethos is, is threatened. And I think the same thing applies to society as a whole. Uh, our society, actually, and this is analogous to the happiness of a family, uh, there's, ma there's many objectives that we're trying to achieve. Um, summed up, I guess, in this statement here, the first bullet, a sustainable and inclusive growth in a free society. So there's something there about both uh, capitalism and democracy. Um, 
in order to achieve those, those, those objectives, um, we need a number of systems to work properly. And I hope this is gonna be playing into Alan's later comments. Uh, we need a number of systems to be um, uh, functioning properly. Uh, we need the economic system to function well, the environmental system, public health system, the political system, and I could add others, but uh, thinking in terms of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, these four are probably enough. Um, the point is that each one of these systems is a, is a complex adaptive system. And what I, what I mean by that is that their proper functioning depends upon the interaction of thousands and times millions of interacting agents. And uh, those, those interactions um, can often lead to, sorry, I forgot to turn off my phone. Um, those interactions can often uh, lead to uh, e e efficiency in the system, but they also sometimes sow, the, sow the, the, the seeds for complete breakdown. And these systems do in fact break down uh, on, a pretty, on a pretty regular basis. And I guess the point that I want to make today is that uh, all of those systems that I've just mentioned, the economic, environmental, public health, and political, seem to me to be in, in positions where they're under quite significant stress. And because they're all interacting and, and, and interlinked, problems in any one of those systems could easily spill over onto the others. Now, uh, we could talk about any one of those spillovers, but today I want to focus on a very sp specific one, which is the spillover from the economic system uh, to the political system. Um, as if that weren't enough, that we've got the complexity of the problems it faces, let me just say briefly that there's a lot of things that complicate uh, the search for policy solutions. And again, I have my little quote here. Uh, it ain't the things you don't know what get you. It's the things you know for sure, which ain't so. Uh, the first thing that we have to do is we have to be humble about the fact that these problems are very complex and that we, we, don't, we shouldn't automatically think we've got the right answers. But the problem is that people, particularly policymakers, do get stuck into belief systems where they think they know what's going on and the honest reality is that they, they don't. Well, even if you do have the proper degree of humility, uh, getting the proper policy solutions uh, depends on a number of different things. And with respect to each one of them, there are some problems. Uh, the first question is always, what should we do? Uh, and there, um, you know, we, we try to approach it from the perspective of some theory or, or whatever, but there are, there, are, there are problems. One of the problems with what should we do is that we often simply don't know. Uh, we don't have enough insights to the science. Think about all of the changes that, of thought that have occurred in the course of the pandemic. There's a problem of ignorance. Another problem is trade-offs, uh, that you can do something that seems to be good in the short run, uh, but over the longer run, it can cause problems. So I'm thinking in particular, for example, of let's use easy money to, to, to offset the problem of inadequate demand. But that easy money then encourages a buildup of debt that in the longer run impedes the growth that we're actually trying to support. And then there's the problem of spillovers. So a very good example would be um, we have an environmental problem with fossil fuels, let's raise carbon taxes. But of course, if carbon taxes then contribute to increase in prices and then to a wage price uh, dynamic that is itself destabilizing, we have an issue. So what should we do? Uh, not so easy. What could we do? Uh, there's another constraint on good policy. Um, the, the many aspects to it, but the particular one I'm concerned about is power being inadequately allocated. And the best example there would be things like pandemics, uh, environmental damage. These are global problems, but there's no global government. Uh, so there's an issue. And what we did, what would we do? And here we have the problem of short-sightedness and inadequate leadership, uh, that many of the solutions, policy solutions to problems 
have got short run costs and longer run benefits, but to get people to see, including the political leadership, that it's worth paying the short run cost for the longer term benefit is not easy. So the fallback solution very, very frequently becomes denial, essentially. Uh, we don't have a problem. If we have a problem, it's under control. And that leads you to more of the same pro po policies. And what I'm going to suggest in just a moment is that is particularly a problem when more of the same policies are the policies that cause the problems in the first place. So uh, some general questions about what's the policy problem and what are the solutions. Now let's go on to uh, the, the meat of the presentation. Uh, indicators of current economic and financial fragility. Again, I start with a, a joke. A fellow is, uh, he's lost, he's lost in the, the winding lanes of Ireland and he wants to get to Dublin. He sees an old man in the field and he says, how do I get to Dublin? And the old man responds, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. Well, that's the nature of the problem. We are starting from here and where we're starting from is not a place where we want to start from. Uh, first point I would make is that um, debt ratios uh, in the global economy have been going up steadily for decades. Um, the Institute of International Finance says that the ratio of uh, debt to GDP in 2008 was 280%. Uh, by two, uh, prior to the pandemic, it had risen to 321%. Today, it's of the order of 350%. Uh, these are big numbers. Um, it is also debt, sadly, of decreasing quality. So that if you look, for example, at corporate debt, what you'll see is that in the last 10 years, there's been a massive increase in debt that is just above junk level. You'll also see when you look at loans, that they're loans where the covenants to ensure proper behavior on the part of the debtor, uh, those, those constraints on their behavior are, are becoming less and less and less. So we have some problems at that level. Um, I would contend that we have difficulties in the financial system. Uh, I know that there are many people who say the capital ratios of banks are now much higher than they were before. Uh, that is true, uh, but as Martin Wolf once said, uh, tripling something close to zero doesn't get you very much. So that is a, a, an issue. Uh, and I would point out too, that when we talk about capital ratios, uh, that our banks in particular face some threats now. I'm thinking about cyber, I'm thinking about climate change, I'm thinking about FinTech, uh, that probably mean they need more capital now than they needed, uh, let's say a few decades ago. Uh, many asset prices are still historically very high. Uh, we know that they've been coming down in the last little while. Uh, but when you look at uh, things like um, um, price to earnings ratios and um, things of that nature, uh, the numbers are still very high. Uh, real estate in many countries is still uh, extraordinarily high by, by um, historical standards. So um, that too, I think, is, uh, is an area where we have to be, uh, have to be concerned. Um, the resurgence, uh, no, markets functioning badly. Um, I remind you that in, um, I think it was September of 2019, uh, in March of 2020, uh, even the market for US treasuries, the biggest and most liquid market in the world, uh, basically stopped working. And there's still a great deal of uncertainty as to why this happened and what ought to be done about it. Um, resurgence of fraud and outright delusion. Uh, always at the end of big cycles, we see this kind of behavior. Uh, I won't run through the list of names that have been in the front pages of the Financial Times in the recent years, Terranos, White Wirecard, uh, Greensill, uh, Archegos, the, the name goes, on and on. Uh, Warren Buffett just two days ago or three days ago, I think talked about uh, the stock market as being almost totally a casino. So these are not good signs for future economic and financial stability. We've had a whole decade of slow growth of investment, productivity and potential. And of course now adding to all of this, uh, we have the uncertainties uh, arising from COVID and uh, the Russian invasion. 
Um, and I sadly, I don't think we've seen the end of, of the side effects of all of those things. Um, I also want to make the point, and I referred to it before, that policy solutions, what we have thought about as po policy solutions, have in the fullness of time actually become the problem. Or as Pogo, uh, the American comic strip hero put it, uh, we have seen the enemy and them is us. Um, the most important thing, I think, against a backdrop of what has been positive supply shocks and low inflation over the last uh, couple of decades, largely due to the reintroduction of China, I think, and India and, and other emerging markets into the global supply chains, against that backdrop of, of positive supply shocks and low inflation, um, we've had extraordinary monetary policy for um, two, if not three decades. Um, there has never been occasions when in good times, uh, monetary policy has tightened as much as it has eased during the bad times. So we had what were at the times considered to be extraordinary periods of monetary easing 1987, 1990, 1998, 2001, 2008, uh, stayed easy for the last decade. And of course, it's doubled down since the pandemic. And that has led to a lot of uh, very unpleasant side effects. I've written a lot about this. Uh, I think it has contributed to all of those financial fragilities that I just mentioned a moment ago, uh, all the unintended consequences, uh, including the slow growth of potential. Um, and um, that is something that, um, that continues almost to the present day. Uh, I would also note that government debt buildup has also become increasingly unsustainable. Uh, fiscal expansion has not been central uh, to the macroeconomic leaning against downturns. That's been, most of the hard work has been left to monetary policy. But regardless, uh, government debts do build up in bad times. And governments have never, and this is analogous to monetary policy, they never tighten up as much in the expansion as they ease up in the downturn. And the upshot of that is that in the same way that interest rates have, have been ratcheting down for decades, government debt levels have been building, have been ratcheting up uh, for decades. And the, K, the Cato Institute is actually, I think in Washington, uh, has done a lot of work on this over the years, uh, looking at not just on balance sheet, but also off balance sheet items. And their basic conclusion in the US, for example, is that total government liabilities are of the, or, are of the order of 400% of GDP. And the bottom line there is that these contracts between the governments and the people, and this is not just in the United States, it's virtually everywhere. These contracts will not be, on, will not be honored. They cannot be honored and they will not be honored. And then the interesting question is, we can turn to this later, is what does all this mean for the uh, the, the social contract and the democratic contract. Um, financial regulation has encouraged evasion. Uh, one of the features uh, that we saw prior to the great financial crash in 2008 was the tightening of banking regulation. Uh, but what it did was it encouraged people to move into the shadow banks. And as many of you be, may be aware, it was the shadow banks uh, the non-banks were really at the heart of the great financial crisis. And um, unfortunately, uh, what tends to happen is that whenever there is a crisis uh, in a kind of wider financial sphere, then the safety net gets widened to support the people in that wider sphere, which just creates moral hazard and encourages people to behave even more badly going forward than they have in the past. So my bottom line here is that uh, Paul, we are in a place where we don't want to be. And to a considerable degree, this has been self-inflicted by the economic policies that we have chosen to, to follow. Um, at the risk of being too negative, 
as if these problems were bad enough, um, there are um, further problems coming down the road. Um, we have a number of negative supply side shocks uh, that I think could end in either inflation or in deflation. I'll come to that in the next slide. Uh, that's why this slide begins with this quote from Robert Frost, one of his poems. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. Uh, but what the poem concludes that either way, uh, it's not gonna be a very pleasant outcome. Um, one of the things that we have to worry about these negative supply side shocks, um, the first point, and this goes back to something I was saying earlier on, pre-pandemic uh, resource misallocations, um, easy money has had effects on the real economy. It's invited people, uh, because interest rates have been so low and money has been so easily available, it has invited people to do a lot of silly things. A lot of money has been allocated to sectors and companies that will in the end never prove profitable. And all of that capital in some sense will have been wasted. So that what we think of as being potential uh, is actually uh, probably higher than the underlying reality. Um, second point is post-pandemic hysteresis. And by hysteresis, we, we just mean sort of lingering effects of the pandemic. Um, all downturns, and there's quite a literature on this now, all downturns leave a permanent scar in the economy. And I think there are grounds for belief, and I've no time to go into the details, uh, that the, 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 the COVID pandemic is likely to leave more scars than most. Uh, not least of which it's reminded us of the need for resilience, that efficiency isn't everything. Uh, and as we move from uh, an efficient economy to a more resilient economy, obviously there's going to be a, a cost in terms of that shift of, of resources. The most important thing, and it's still playing out of course, is the fact that, that the Omicron thing is still uh, at a very early stage in China. So the supply side implications of that are still to come. Uh, another problem that we face going forward is population aging. Uh, Charles Goodhart and his colleague Pradhan uh, have written a whole book about this, so I won't go into it. Uh, but what it does to mean, at least in their interpretation, is that as um, population ages and there are fewer people of working age, uh, that not only does aggregate supply go down, uh, but aggregate demand will go up as older, richer people continue to spend, although they don't produce. Um, and as uh, companies increasingly turn to investment and capital to replace the workers that just aren't there. And then, of course, we've got all the commodity price shocks. Uh, we saw this even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we are moving on to um, the green world but it's also a world that is going to be reliant on metals. And there's going to be a lot of difficulties associated with getting those things out of the ground. I think that's an underestimated problem going forward. And of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has really um, aggravated all of that stuff. And lastly, of course, there's deglobalization aggravated by geopolitical tensions. And um, uh, I needn't say much more about that because we're all we're all sort of aware of what happens if the supply chain uh, split between a, uh, an authoritarian de denominated uh, supply chain and one that's um, generated by democracies. Um, both depression and high inflation are extreme but plausible outcomes. Um, I said earlier on that um, the economy is a complex adaptive system. Uh, one thing about these systems is that they can go in a number of different directions. It's sort of the process that's really important as much as the starting point. And um, I think that uh, both depression and high inflation are extreme but plausible outcomes given where we're starting from and the problems that we currently have. And the most important point to note is that high debt levels increase vulnerability in both good times and bad. 
they increase vulnerability in good times because interest rates go up and the debt can no longer be serviced. And they increase vulnerability in bad times because uh, the debtor's revenues are inadequate to, to service the debt. And uh, both of these processes have been well described in the economic literature. I'll just mention it. Uh, Irving Fisher wrote a whole book about this stuff, about debt deflation uh, in the 1930s. And um, in the early 1990s, uh, the high inflation process, which is a divergent path, but again, driven by high debt levels, was described by uh, Sargent and Wallace and an old friend of mine from the University of uh, Basel, Peter Bernholtz, uh, has also written a whole book about, uh, about how, how that happens in practice. So Sergeant Wallace gave the theory and Peter says, historically, we see this all the time. And the last bullet, of course, is just to say again that both uh, forms of debt pose serious problems. And sadly, uh, we've got uh, both uh, high levels of public debt and private debt to contend with. Well, let me turn over then to and uh, much more rapidly uh, to the other side of the equation. So I've, I've painted a picture here of, we should expect economic stress coming down the road. Uh, the next question is, uh, so what does that mean for the other system, for the political system? Well, my first point is that um, we, we, we know that democracies are vulnerable to a number of threats. Uh, my little quote there is from Frederick Hayek, dedicated, you know, this is the road to serfdom, which was dedicated to the socialists of all parties. And Hayek was just trying to make the point that uh, both the communists and the fascists uh, are totally contemptuous of private freedoms, and that uh, that will lead you into all sorts of problems. Uh, my broader point, I guess, is that there's a number of threats uh, to democracy going forward. Um, First broad point, I guess, is it's a complex adaptive system. Sunil gave us right at the beginning a, a, a nice list of all of the sort of institutional requirements in order to support democracy. Uh, I could make the point, but I won't make it right now, that every one of those institutional supports that he uh, noted are under threat. Uh, so that's the first point. Um, the Second point I would make is that there's a natural tension in democracies to balance individual freedom against public good or against the public will, I guess, in the, in the, in the literature. Um, and you can get that balance wrong. And a lot of people over a lot of millennia, because this really starts with uh, Plato, uh, with Aristotle and politics, uh, you can get problems on both sides. So on the one hand, um, uh, James Madison and, and many others uh, put, uh, put the emphasis on how factions in, 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 in our political democracies threaten instability, injustice, and confusion, in his words. Um, and a good example of the genre is if you have unfettered capitalism and people make so much money that they can exercise political power and do so in a conscious way to sort of gain that power for their own ends, then you can see that we're gonna have a lot of problems. Um, a problem that I guess gets closer to that, that line by uh, Hayek is the balance can tip in the other way too far as well, where the, 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 the popular will is the only thing that counts. And the difficulty is that we've have, we have absolutely no guarantee that the popular will will choose to maintain uh, democratic principles. And um, the late lamented Madeleine Albright just a few years ago wrote a book which is called Fascism, A Warning. And it really was about in part about how this happens, about how the extreme left and the extreme right that seem so different, this is Hayek's point, the extreme left and the extreme right actually find there's more that binds them together. And when you get the nationalists together with the socialists, I guess what you get is the national socialists. Uh, I think those fault lines are beginning to show. Um, the pessimistic version of that joke I gave you earlier about how do I get to Dublin? 
the pessimistic, uh, pessimistic last line is you can't get to Dublin from here. Um, and when you look at what's going on, uh, there are a lot of things I think that we should be worried about. Uh, the growing inequality of income, uh, wealth, and opportunity. Um, the middle classes sort of getting eaten away. I guess the thing I worry about most is the, the growing inequality of opportunity. Uh, saw this at the OECD over many years, the constant decline in intergenerational mobility. If you're born rich, you stay rich. If you're born poor, you stay poor. Um, that's a real problem. Um, added to it, going back to what I was talking about just a little bit earlier, a uh, growing suspicion that the rich and elites are gaming the system and growing evidence that indeed that is so. And of course, that, that leads to the conclusion that it's not fair. But it's not fair unless it's an emotional response, okay? Anger and people retreating into their own angry silos. So that's something that we're seeing happening. And of course, it's being supported by domestic people uh, who, who really are trying uh, to uh, um, create anxiety through cultural and, and, and racial division. And lastly, um, of course, we've got the, the social networks domestically becoming echo chambers, um, which we're all aware of. You're, you're only fed the stuff that you agree with. It's a recipe for division. And of course, our international... Um, I won't say enemies, it's too strong to too strong a word, but it's being exploited at the moment. We know by the Russians, by the Chinese, through hybrid warfare, looking for the chinks, seeking to discredit us. And this is going on actively as we speak. Uh, and this, of course, raises fears for the future of democracy. Uh, this is my second to last slide, so I'm just about finished. Um, the Freedom House, in their latest publication, uh, just came out about a month ago, uh, has got this quote, the global order is nearing a tipping point. Uh, these people have been doing their work for the last 50 years, so I think um, we probably should be listening to them. A uh, shrinking number of liberal democracies. Uh, last year, they recorded 75% of all people live in countries where their freedoms became less, not more. Uh, perhaps even more worrisome, the growing and I should have put this in here, growing electoral support for strong men and populist causes. So you're looking all over the place, both the US, Donald Trump, Brexit, um, Bolsonaro, um, the list goes on and on where people are being elected to positions where they can actively erode freedoms, declining trust in national government, increasing us versus them thinking, and then rounding up the usual suspects for them, going back to what I said earlier about the intention of actively dissenting, actively encouraging internal dissent, and of course, the declining appetite for international cooperation. And lastly, um, there are many historical precedents for political regime change, sometimes quite sudden, <clears throat> the quote from W.B. Yeats from the Second Coming, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. The first one, of course, is political change uh, triggered by economic and financial crises. Uh, here, there's a growing, growing literature. Uh, I would just recommend one particular piece by uh, Funke, Schulerich, and uh, Trebisch, uh, where they look at the, the data over the course of the last 40 years and 100 advanced countries and look at the implications of economic and financial crises. And what we see historically is that they get triggered, sorry, that they, they trigger political polarization and particularly extremism on the nationalist right. Um, I recognize the fact that political change can also be triggered by env environmental crises. Uh, again, if you read Collapse by Jared Diamond, there's plenty of it political change triggered by pandemics. Again, a huge literature on that. But what I wanna go back to finish is where I started is that I think today what's not getting enough attention is we've got some significant fragilities on the economic side 
And I think there's a reasonable chance that they could be uh, the next trigger for political instability. So I'm sorry, a bit over, but I hope not too long. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Bill. Uh, uh, Martha, uh, 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 the airwaves are yours. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Sunil. I do not have slides. Uh, so you just have to look at me, um, but it is lovely to be here. I'm delighted to have such august company and I want to thank Bill for those excellent thought provoking remarks. I'm coming at these issues from a slightly different vantage point than my two colleagues here. When we were setting up for this discussion, I asked Bill and the rest of the panel what the dependent variable was going to be in this talk for our discussion. And their answer was the stability of democracy was the core topic on the table, which is excellent. I am a political scientist. Political science thinks a lot about this problem. But I think it does so through a slightly different lens than economists. So I want to use my remarks to flip the causal arrow that Bill discussed, rather than ask how economics impacts the prospects for democracy. I want to spend a few minutes asking how politics shapes the financial trends, the financial fragilities and instabilities that Bill describes. And my goal here is actually pretty simple. I just want to remind us that this is a reciprocal relationship between politics and economics. We know and we have always known that there are deep tensions between the dynamics of capitalism on the one hand and political stability on the other. At bottom, creative destruction of capitalism creates huge problems for politics and political stability. It always has. Creative destruction creates winners and losers, and losers get grouchy. And when structures, economic structures, other kinds of structures, entrench those losers so they feel like they're stuck, they'll always be losers, we get unstable, unhappy politics. And, and specifically, it can undermine faith in the legitimacy of democratic institutions, which makes the kinds of political issues Bill described all the more pressing and tricky to deal with. So Bill White talked about this relationship between capitalism and democracy as a complex adaptive system. And, and part of what I want to do in these remarks is unpack this assumption that there's adaptation going on in complex adaptive systems. I want to look at Bill's claims maybe sideways and one actually ask um, how much adapting various institutions are capable of. Um, what is the tensile strength, if you want to think about it that way, of both sides of this equation? What's the tensile strength of democracy on the one hand and of some of these markets and economic structures on the other? How flexible and adaptive are both of these things? Um, because one, another way, the uh, framing to put around this and another way to understand Bill's concerns might be, in fact, that you won't get adaptation in this system, which could create some of the very scary outcomes that Bill described. Um, so in flipping this script, I want to talk a little bit about how politics might undermine some of that adaptability, some of that flexibility, some of that tensile strength of institutions um, in the current moment where we're, I think, all justifiably worried about what's going on in the world. And I want to do that by talking about Bill's first slide and his last slide. Um, 
just to focus the conversation. I mean, in the first slide Bill showed us, he framed uh, the problematique as spillovers from the economy into the political sphere. And that's a really important thing to look at. Um, and it's a good thing for Bill to be looking at. Um, given my training, I tend to think of it the other way around. A lot of Bill's indicators of fragility, in my view, have political sources. Government regulation structures markets and it structures those economic institutions uh, that are causing so many of the problems in Bill's bullet points. We have the fragilities we have because governments created a lot of those fragilities. They made the monetary policy. They regulated or failed to regulate to create the situations in Bill's slide that he described so clearly. You know, we have the inequalities we do, the fragilities we do, because governments have chosen not to curb those inequalities or not address those fragilities. You know, gov US government has chosen big tax cuts favoring the wealthy, most recently the Trump tax cuts in 2017-18. You know, corporate taxes have been following, falling steadily on both the business side and for individuals. And I'm gonna leave it to the economists to fill in all the details of that, but the effects of those political actions by democracies on this fragility situation, on inequality among their own citizen and citizens and the fragility of these institutions has been profound. But the sources, I would say, are political as much as they are economic. I mean, similarly, the US government has chosen laws that reduce labor power, which might be a counterpoint to growing corporate power, which entrenches some of this inequality. My colleague, Adam Dean here at GW has been doing some excellent work on this, looking at not just the US, but Argentina and India. I mean, capitalism can and does organize very effectively in contemporary democracy. The same is not true of labor and the collective action problems all of us here, I think, understand pretty well. There's this basic asymmetry that political scientists have been worrying about for decades, centuries, one could argue. Um, it is really difficult uh, for labor to organize and democratic governments, democratically elected governments routinely are passing laws that make it more difficult. So the US, government and the government of a great many democracies have been part of the creation of these fragilities that create distrust in institutions that have expanded inequality and feed into some of the instabilities that we see. And Bill, I think, is absolutely right about some of the obstacles to smart policy here. There are trade-offs. Indeed, there are trade-offs. Short-term thinking abounds in policy circles where we could really use some long-term thinking. All of these are baked into policymaking and into politics. And no political scientist is gonna be surprised that all of these economic systems are creating inequality and instability. I, I think what is more puzzling for political scientists and what a large number of my colleagues are working on is this more foundational question, which Bill addressed in passing, but for political science is really central. Why voters in democratic countries vote for parties championing policies that promote this kind of fragility, inequality, and instability, and why they vote for parties and politicians who whose commitment to democratic principles is tenuous, perhaps. I mean, this is a global problem. It's true across the European Union. The EU is struggling with this among its members. Democratic backsliding is a huge problem. It's true across Latin America. It's true in Asia. Um, there's a whole research conversation in political science about this. A lot of it points 
not just to economic sources, but also to the more sociological sources. Identity politics matters a lot for this, as does extreme nationalism, but that's probably a different conversation. Um, let me just wrap up by saying a few words about Bill's last slide as well. Um, on the last slide, Bill asked whether the economy could be the trigger of triggers for change. And I would say certainly yes, in the sense that big economic shocks are absolutely going to create big political consequences. But those big economic shocks, when political scientists study them, almost always have political roots. It is governmental decisions, very often decisions by democracies that have created the market conditions for all of the financial behavior surrounding crises. Uh, it is government policy, which has cre created the 2007-8 financial shocks and all the ones before it. So my you know, larger problematique that I would like to put on the table it has to do with the political origins of some of these economic fragilities that Bill has so nicely sketched for us. Negative shocks often have political as well as economic origins. And thinking about this problem from both sides of the causal equation can be beneficial for us. Um, the quote on Bill's slide that really resonated for me was his Pogo quote, that we have met the enemy and them is us. Political scientists are right there with you, Bill. I think that's true. Great. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Martha. Um, um, Alan, uh, the airwaves are yours. Well, thank you very much indeed for the invitation. And it's an honor to be with you. And uh, it's always good to hear Bill. But in particular, it was very good to hear Martha, because uh, one of my <clears throat> long-standing difficulties with economics is that we always talk about exogenous shocks. And the impression is these shocks come from outside. And therefore, we shouldn't be too concerned about the endogenous uh, generation of those shocks. And yet Martha just insisted exactly on the point I want to make, that if you look into it, most of these things are not exogenous to the whole system. It's just that we were looking at too limited a part of the system. And once we open the horizons, then there aren't many things which are exogenous. I mean, if a, an asteroid hits the planet, that'll be exogenous or an earthquake maybe. But most of the things that we have to deal with actually turn out to be endogenous to the overall system. So next slide, please. <coughs> ah, there we go. So economists have tended to have a vision of the world uh, the world economy is a ship which sails on a course and occasionally it gets knocked off it by one of these exogenous shocks. And I think that's a very wrong uh, impression of how the economy works. And there you will see a ship that's sailing on that sort of course. And of course, those of you who have some historical knowledge will recognize that that's the Titanic. So you can see that this ship is not headed for very comfortable waters. But Edward Wilson, the famous biologist, once observed, the world economy is a ship speeding through uncharted waters strewn with dangerous shoals, and there's no general agreement on how the economy works. And I think that you could add to that, given that he was a biologist in particular, that we should think of the socioeconomic system more as an organism rather than as a machine. A machine's better because you know that if you push something here, something else will happen there. Whereas an organism is somewhat unpredictable what will happen if some part of it gets interfered with. Next slide, please. So first thing to talk about, I think, is these shocks, when they do hit, uh, when they develop, if you like, even endogenously, have, of course, very different uh, consequences for different sorts of people. And a number of recent reports have suggested that those countries that concentrated first on the health problem in the pandemic, and then worried about what was happening to the economy, I took that as second, 
are, came out of the pandemic or are coming out of it much better than those who did the contrary and worried more about the consequences of the economy first. And so those countries with stronger safety nets did better. But then we have Bill White's moral hazard problem. If we have these safety nets, won't people just sort of lie around and do nothing or cheat? And I think that the answer to that is I had a look at the figures because I was sort of uh, struck by that argument. And uh, the, the first argument is actually there's always a certain amount of fraud and cheating in whatever system uh, the government puts into, into place. And it hasn't significantly increased uh, through the pandemic, except towards the end when a, a certain number of people realized that they could get some money out quickly. But the other thing is that the positive effects of universal access to care, and that means a very broad safety net, actually outweighs, in my view at least, the effects of the cheating that goes on. But I think maybe Bill has a less sanguine uh, attitude towards people's behavior than I do. Next slide, please. So why do we come up with these res uh, results as, as economists? which don't seem to capture some of the things that Bill was talking about. Well, first of all, I think the problem is partly the models that we use, and secondly, magic numbers. It's amazing to people like me that after Russia invaded the Ukraine, within, uh, I would say, two days, the big organizations like the IMF, and I have to apologize, Sunil, who has uh, spent many years with the IMF, um, put out forecasts saying the Russian invasion will probably cause so much decrease in uh, global GNP. And I think uh, you say to yourself, how did they manage to work that out? I mean, all the possible consequences. You know, they could have gone total invasion, could have been that uh, the Ukraine collapsed quickly, or it could have been that it, uh, as it did, it, it, it sort of wore down. Uh, even nuclear weapons could be used. So how do we manage to calculate these numbers, come out with a number for the growth rate for um, the, the world GNP? And I think that the war has exacerbated all sorts of negative economic trends, disrupted commerce, price hikes for fuel and food. But how do we manage to calculate a number for those things? And that's always struck me as being a, a, a real problem. And are all the possible trajectories taken into consideration? Do we consider the geopolitical situation? Are we worried about the reduction in energy supplies to Europe? Would Germany accept a possible 2% 2, uh, 2 decrease in their GDP, which is what's um, estimated if Russian ga ga gas is cut off? You have to remember that when Greece was, uh, Germany was faced with Greece, it was perfectly happy to impose a 21% decrease in their GDP but people aren't that uh, um, magnanimous. When you calculate all those numbers, did anybody ask political science experts what they thought that the Russians would actually do? And I think that was a very important feature. Of course, some of those real experts still got it wrong, but nevertheless, shouldn't we include the political considerations into our calculations? Now, one thing that helped me a bit was that there's an IMF blog which actually is a discussion amongst people at the IMF about what's going to happen. And one of the interesting things is that they seem to take the numbers from the models and then talk about what might change those numbers. And so the original numbers that come out are always from a model, but all of these are what are called equilibrium models and equilibrium models in the world that we're in. I don't think we're anywhere near a normal idea of equilibrium. Uh, next slide, please. So it's also, I said, very relative. It depends on who you are in these things. And uh, as I said, Germany was perfectly uh, happy to uh, impose a 21% 21, uh, 21 decrease in GDP on uh, Greece. But they are very reluctant, for the moment at least, to cut off completely fossil fuels from Russia, which would probably cost them 2%. And you can see here, in this, uh, in this uh, cartoon, the people in Ukraine saying, I, re I really feel sorry for the Americans um, having to pay higher gas prices, you know, as they're running away from the bombs. So you can see 
impact on, on different people is very different and very difficult to summarize in simple figures that percentage of GDP. Next slide, please. So I want to just say a very quick word about models and to show you, I think, where economists sometimes get trapped. And Mario Draghi was talking at one point about the euro and why the euro went wrong. And he said, well, I think the euro was a, like a bumblebee, he said, that we know it's a, mystery, it's a mystery of nature because it shouldn't fly, but instead it does. He said, and then something must have happened and that we know what that is after the financial crisis. Then he said the bumblebee would have to graduate to being a real bee, and that's what it's doing. But this doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, the bumblebee actually does fly. So there you see Mario Draghi addressing the bumblebee and saying, are you sure you want to keep on doing this? And the point is that it's the model that said that the bumblebee doesn't fly. The observation, empirical observation, is that it does fly. And so I think we should be very careful about looking at our models and not looking at reality. Next slide, please. So when we're faced with inconvenient facts, we tend to wonder what the problem with the world is, not what the problem with our model is. And worse, we sometimes try to take measures which will make the world more like our model. And I think that's even worse. And as Mervyn King, the former governor of the Bank of England said, it's hubris to think that we understand how the economy works. We don't. Just as it's hubris to think that leaving markets to their own devices will lead to nirvana. And I think that something, some, somebody suggested we needed more humility. And I think that's absolutely true. Although Oscar Wilde, to use an Irish quote, just to satisfy Bill, said, modesty in all things, particularly in modesty. And I think uh, economists do deserve to be much more modest. Next slide, please. Last remark, really, uh, is about the other part of this, the other elephant in the room, which is climate change. And I think our problem as economists is that we're losing sight of the science. The science suggests that things are much worse than we thought they were, whereas we continue to work with economic models, which still talk about possible five degrees warming. Five degrees warming will take us in the other direction, further back than the last ice age. And Giorgio Parisi got the Nobel Prize in physics from pointing out why the climate is becoming so, uh, so much less stable. It's a phenomenon called stochastic resonance, which I can't go into here, but, and I'm not even competent to do that. But what, it's, what happens is that the, uh, the globe is not warming uniformly, and the Arctic is warming much faster than other parts. As a result of the Arctic warming faster, there was a vortex, a polar vortex, which kept the cold in uh, around the North Pole, but which has weakened because of global warming. And now suddenly the polar vortex has got slides south and you find Texas experiencing severe cold, which is not experienced before. And so the whole world pattern of climate is changing and the economic consequences of that will turn out, I think, to be absolutely terrifying. And we're not taking enough notice of that. And I think we should listen to the scientists as well, because the economic consequences of that in the long run, and even in the short run, as you see, you know, with Australia burning, all the Mediterranean region countries burning, Chile and so forth, California, you can see that those consequences are already becoming very apparent. So next slide, please. Last, very last remark is resilience. It's been mentioned already, and we wrote an article in Nature Physics recently on system, systemic resilience in economics. And you can have two types of resilience. One says, okay, something bad is happening. Let's just intervene and put a measure in place to deal with it. The second is resilience by design, which says, no, we know more about how the system works and how it interacts. Therefore, we should worry about any measure we put in and look at it as it will work through the system. And that, for example, means we need a lot of redundancy in the system. And of course, that's exactly the opposite of what we've been doing in the past with supply chains. There we had just in time, but now what we really need is just in case systems, things which are not being used all the time. In 2014, Bill Gates said, what we need is an army of specialists who work on all sorts of different problems thinking about potential threats to our society. 
And he said, after all, armies do these training sessions all the time, but they're not fighting wars all the time, and we should be doing the same. Then he said in 2017, I think it was, well, 27 million people saw my TED talk, and he said, I don't think anybody in authority listened to it. But Ben Bernanke had a very reasonable attitude to this. He said, I just think it's not realistic to think, as economists tend to do, that human, human beings can fully anticipate all possible interactions and complex developments. The best approach for dealing with this uncertainty is to make sure that the system is fundamentally resilient and we have as many fail-safes and backup arrangements as possible. It won't be uh, efficient in the usual sense, but it will be, in the long run, much more sustainable. Next slide, please. So the conclusion, we're faced with radical uncertainty in a radically complex world, and that sort of world is not amenable to convenient formal modeling, which I spent some of my time doing, however sophisticated. We have to accept that looking for simple causal relations will not work, and accept also that we're not living in an equilibrium world and worry about how this world evolves through and into non-equilibrium states. And there's a Chinese curse, which apparently isn't a Chinese curse, that says, may you live in interesting times. And I can't think of more interesting times than the times that we're living in. But the famous economic ship, which was supposed to be sailing along, is actually seen there. And that's the end of it. And at the beginning, you saw it. That's the Titanic. And you can see that the Titanic is in need of help. So as Bill says, good luck with that. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Alan. Um, let me try and uh, start with um, <clears throat> a question which I hope you will answer more optimistically. Um, <laughs> we've had a fantastic overview of uh, the systemic problems that we're facing. And so the question to all three of you, given that we have got 15 minutes left, um, is we yes, of course. I think uh, we 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 agree with Alan. We agree with Bill. And we agree with um, Martha that we're dealing with a, a, a really complex adaptive system. So the, the the question is: so what are the key nodes for action and policy? I mean, a, a, people have asked on uh, you know questions regarding um, you know labor power, uh, regarding the educational system, um, a, a variety of questions. But what I want to try to pitch to you and and and. In, in the context of what we are seeing, um, there's a very interesting report by the, uh, in, the in the proceedings of the uh, National Academy of Sciences talking about how uh, complex systems um, are sustainable when we have diversity and a diversity of views. And what we have seen over time is polarization reducing diversity, which sort of undermines our ability to cooperate and, 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 and our ability to respond. Um, so, the, so the question to you is, given the situation that we are in, what are the key nodes through which we should try and shape uh, uh, the future path of the system? Bill, um, you can start and then. Mm. I think, the, I think the, 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 the first point is that we need a kind of intellectual revolution. I think we've all been saying the same stuff that the, the world is a complex place and that uh, simple solutions are uh, just simply not, um, not possible. Um, in a way, and I'm hesitant to say this because it, it may sound totally Pollyannish, the, the, the expectations of the public have to be reduced to a level where we can actually provide credible policies um, to, to, to do what we say we're going to do. So the, the worry at the moment, for, for me at least, is that the, 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 the public believes that there are simple answers. And when the world is sort of unfolding in a rather difficult way so that hard political choices are being made, uh, the public is, needs to be disabused, disabused abused of the idea that there are simple answers and that the simple answers being provided by the strong men are just a chimera. Now, how one goes about doing that, I guess we go back to, to Anne's point, is that you know, the fundamental question 
I think that she said that the political scientists were asking at the moment were why is it that people are voting for people whose policies will harm them uh, at the economic level and will also reduce the democratic freedoms that they cherish? Why do they do that? And what do we need to do in order to stop them believe to stop them believing what they believe and face the realities? Um, I'm I'm tempted to say we we need to get onto a kind of a kind of wartime wartime mentality that basically says there there are hard things here there are costs that have to be absorbed they will be absorbed fairly uh, and we have to get on with it. Um, I'm just thinking now of another another quote from John Kenneth Galbraith. He said many years ago, politics is not the art of the possible. Okay? It is choosing between the unpalatable and the disastrous. And the sooner that we make those decisions, uh, the, the more likely we're going to be to come to some kind of conclusion. Still more practically, the underlying problem, it seems to me, is that is somehow the hollowing out of the middle class and that brings you back to Plato, uh, brings you back to Aristotle, you know, in the politics, which is the essence of a de democratic system is one in which the middle class is very important. How do we do that? Martha, your take on the key nodes? Oh, I wish you didn't ask such good questions, Sunil. Uh, th this, I mean, this is a hard one. I don't have a simple answer to that. So um, let me actually just uh, jump on Bill's last point because I, I think that is important. I mean, there are two issues. I, I spoke in my remarks about the problem of voters, which is a big topic in the political science universe. But and economists have been part of this conversation. Voters are not the only piece that matters politically here, it's institutions. And economists were right there with us political scientists for several decades with enthusiasm about getting the institutions right as a way to solve all kinds of problems. I think we are now all wiser and more humbler and more skeptical individuals than we were 20 or 30 years ago about the ability of institutional engineering to solve all ills. But, but it does strike me that there is some low hanging fruit out there. And, and that, and again, how, you know, one of the questions is how do you make, get, create political incentives for politicians to do basic redistributive policies that, you know, corporate taxes, rich people taxes, all those things that could create both optics and send messages that actually move money around in ways that would, um, you know, address, help uh, both symbolically create some confidence and might actually do some good in the world. But I am not seeing a lot of political courage out there to take those kinds of hard moves, and I do not have a magic wand that creates that. Alan, your take. Okay, so I, yeah, I think one of the things that's most uh, very important is power. You know, Adam Smith said, uh, oh, dis uh, unequal distribution of wealth and uh, income doesn't matter because people can't spend um, an indefinite amount of money on things that they might like to have. So it's not very important. Uh, the opposite is true. Why do people want to accumulate so much money? Because it gives them power. And power in, in particular in our society means access to all sorts of ways of influencing people and convincing them of things. And that we've seen recently, in particular with Trump, the persistence of the great lie is absolutely extraordinary. And this is to do with, I think, concentration of wealth and also to do with the fact that we used to limit the amounts of political spending that could be done and this has sort of faded away. And so this is something for Martha, of course, but uh, we uh, manage now, people manage to have an enormous amount of influence. They can buy a lot of the media. Second remark is social media. 
social media have been heavily criticized lately as being very having a very bad influence and making people less happy and the usual argument was well that's because there's all this fake news out there fake news as a paper in science said travels faster and deeper than real news and in fact that's not true Chevalier said in uh, the uh, Institute of Complexity in Paris did a careful survey on tweets and to see how these uh, 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 rumors and stories spread. And he found out that they spread very fast, very deep to people who are pre uh, uh, prejudiced in that direction. So if you get something, there's this con confirmatory bias. So then you anything that agrees with what you say comes to you, even if it's completely fake. So that is good news. It means it doesn't spread through the population, but it's also terribly polarizing. And that's the other thing that Bill, I think, mentioned. Polarization of that sort is something I think we haven't seen before. And uh, that is, uh, I think, going to be very harmful to us. So I don't really have any uh, obvious, simple solutions. But if there were obvious, simple solutions, somebody probably would have had the courage to, in, uh, to actually uh, use them. But uh, I think we are in a difficult situation. And, and people have lost confidence. That's absolutely clear. The yellow jackets, the gilets jaunes in, in Paris, what did they say when they were being told that, well, we have to worry about the climate and so forth? They said, you know, all these people up there <clears throat> are talking about the end of the world. So we're worried about the end of the week. And I think that's exactly where we are. There's a, dis a, a complete uh, separation between what the average guy is really worrying about or the average lady is really worrying about and what the people in the middle, if you like, uh, and policymakers are worried about. And th that's something we have to get around. We have to start to actually talk to people in terms that they really basically feel are important. Um, so, so let me ask, um, there, there are, uh, I think we've, we've covered at least uh, some uh, aspects of many of the questions that have been raised, um, but a, a <clears throat> one of the questions that you guys mentioned was, uh, the, the shrinking of the middle, the shrinking of the middle class. Um, and, and, and I think that there's a, there's a broader shrinking of the center in the sense that even our views have become more, uh, more extreme. Uh, so so in, in many ways, we've um, abandoned the middle. Um, so the question is, a, a, again, uh, what can we do now in some sense to shore up the middle, the middle, the middle income class, uh, the sense of balance between capital and labor, um, the way we do our education, um, the way we uh, <clears throat> uh, provide uh, social safety nets, what will make um, the system, given the current conjuncture, um, to move more towards uh, the middle and the common good? Because we are, in some sense, facing systemic issues precisely at a time when our collective agency has been I shouldn't say minimized, but has been very adversely affected by a variety of factors. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> Bill, you want to uh, give, it a, give it a go? I mean, these, these are very, I understand they're very, very difficult questions to be put on the spot <laughs> when, when the camera is on is not easy. But, 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 but the question is, we are at a, at a moment um, when our collective agency is diminished and we are facing a climate crisis, uh, 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 a, a political divisiveness, social divisiveness, and so on and so forth. What, how do we go forward? Can I put a, make a provocative remark to stimulate Martha to reply? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, you know, we, we've always worked with this uh, uh, sort of line, this uh, uh, simple line from right to left and so forth with the extremes at the end. And there was some remark about, in fact, maybe the ends actually come together a bit. But I think that's not the uh, right way to look at things now. The, 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 the thing we should look at is why do people feel so strongly that they are somehow being cheated by the system? And I think there are more and more people and the people who feel that most are people on what we used to call the extreme left and the extreme right. So they share that dissatisfaction with the way society works because they feel that somehow they're getting left out. And this is the opposite of the great American dream where everybody 
had the possibility to move up and so forth. So I think that's uh, where the middle, I think, are the people who felt pretty comfortable with where they are. And I think there are fewer and fewer of those. And that's our real problem, that we have these two groups, which in some sense are politically very distinct. On the other hand, they share this common grievance against the system that's cheating them in some way or other, either because they're immigrants who are being allowed in, or, or but they're always, the sense is that I'm not being treated fairly in this system. So that would be my so the diagnosis of the, the <laughs> fundamental problem. And I'm sure Martha has much more wise things to say about that than I do. I'm not sure I have uh, wise things to say. I, I, you know, a couple of random thoughts occur. One is uh, the, uh, how people, I, 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 in my own head, speaking for myself, my guess is that the sense of grievance I would tend to think of as a steady state phenomenon, people are just sort of grouchy. There are large numbers of people are grouchy all the time. But what might have changed is, um, uh, tying this back to Sunil's question, people's sense of agency and capacity to do something about that grievance. Uh, the, perception people have that I have been wronged, I was better off five years ago than I am now, and I can do something about it that might actually matter, that might well have changed. And, and one thing we have not talked about in this conversation, well, I can think of uh, you know, sort of two things. So one is this agency that Sunil's talking about is a perception as much, you can treat it as an objective thing. Politically, I think what matters is the subjective perception of agency because that connects to what Alan was talking about. And, and I think people don't perceive themselves as having agency, that, that self-perception has has changed. And you could say it's declining faith in institutions. You could also just say it is more objective. The political system is actually not being very responsive. And this in the United States, we have gridlock and the political system is not doing much. So the other thing we haven't talked about is intergenerational variation. If, if our students were on this panel, rather than us old people, um, they might have some quite different analyses about cause and effect. And they might have some quite different analyses about connections between the political and the economic that would shed some light in this. Your degree of pessimism might look different depending on whether you're 20 years old, 40 years old, or 60 or 80 years old. And you know, I would just defer to people um, in those younger cohorts because I would expect their views to not be mine. Okay, um, Bill, um, we've run out of time, so you have the last word and then I'll conclude. Okay. Well, in, in, in response to your connection, I'm, I'm reminded of the shortest poem in the world by uh, Muhammad Ali. And the poem was, I, we. And in a sense, it sums it all up that we've been moving into a world where everybody's worried about themselves and their grievances. And I think if there were somehow a way to spark the capacity to realize that we are all sort of in the same boat together and that our concern for our neighbor is essentially a concern for ourselves because we depend upon the interactions with those neighbors, that would be the most important thing. The problem at the moment is it's the powerful. Alan made this point earlier on about economics and power. It's the powerful who, who have the wherewithal at the moment to either continue acting in this narcissistic way or to start taking changes, both economic and political, to ensure that we do get to a world where everybody recognizes the contribution that others make. How you go about doing that, getting the rich and the powerful to understand that their behavior and exercise of power must change in their own self-interest, okay? Like you look at that book, The Great Leveler by Walter, uh, um, 
you know the book I mean. Uh, the, it's in their own self-interest to do something. Whether, whether people will do it, of course, is totally another issue. A, a thank you very much for a fantastic and scintillating discussion. So um, I, don't, I, I think it's almost impossible to try and summarize it, but, but let, me, let me give it a shot um, in, in, in terms of <clears throat> what I gathered. Um, and th this is sort of similar to the conclusions we came in some of the other seminars we've had here. So for example, um, one thing uh, 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 my old professor Bob Frank from Cornell mentioned is that what we need now is in some sense a massive amount of positive contagion, a positive contagion of behavior um, that will help us solve some of these uh, some of these gridlocks uh, that, that 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 you've mentioned, um, and I think let's take um, 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 Alan's framework. Clearly, our system is complex. You know, the economic, the financial, the political system has grown considerably and even more complex. And importantly, information and digital technologies are now rewiring our economy and society in many ways. And and we do not have a full understanding of this new emergent system. Um, and so we require a great amount of humility in trying to study the new channels of policy transmission and, and, and the redesign of institutions um, and, 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 and the policies. And as the system evolves, I think we have to be open, as, as, as all of you have mentioned, that we have to rethink some of the shibboleths that we grew up with. This is a different world. And importantly, as, as Martha pointed out, that you know, we are all uh, old. We need to bring um, the people whose expectations really matter um, into the conversation, because they are going to determine the future of democracy um, um, and, and, and capitalism. And let me end with a last thing to say that, look, political democracy is, is, is meaningless without economic democracy and, and some modicum of individual agency, or at least the perception of individual agency, as, 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 as Martha said. So with that, let me thank you all. It was a brilliant discussion. Um, I think we laid out a lot of the issues. Um, um, I, I hope we are trying to end on a positive note, um, but, but, but there, there it is. Um, I'd like mm -hmm. to wish everyone uh, a good day, wherever you are around in the world. Thank you. Mm -hmm.